Sunday, listening to my words and making them yours if they feel right for you. And as you take this one more breath, in your mind's eye, see a window, a doorway, or a portal through which you can easily pass. A step through this portal and find yourself in a tunnel winding and spiraling to your inner soul. At the end of the tunnel, you see a light, and you move towards that light and step into your soul. Look around and take a stack of all you see within your self, your soul, you. Notice everything that there is. Don't force it. Let the images come to you. Don't judge it. Just be here. Watch. Now look for something that has a reflective surface, a mirror or a pool of some kind. Gaze into the mirror or into the water and see yourself. That's you, your spiritual you, as you truly are. Do you like what you see? More important, do you love that self that is you? Love is the foundation of true magic. Look at yourself in the eyes and tell yourself that it is love. Tell it that wonderful experiences are awaiting. Tell it that today, starting right now, you choose how this life is going to be. Right here and right now, tell it that you take control of this life. Tell it that the grace and the beauty of the divine is already here. You know this, you deeply know it. This is your life now for you to create with your thoughts and your feelings. 
you are not alone. The universal mind, the supreme intelligence, and that self of yours, which is your higher self, lives within you, always creating, always waiting. Forget about the mistakes that you have made. Make this day spectacular. This is the making of your life, yours. Every day is a new life that we are able to create with the guidance of an invisible, intelligent, and loving presence that is around and within, expressing itself to create a world that is the best for you and in return is the best for all. Stay in this knowing for a moment and be blessed. So as we continue to be in the state of love, joy, peace, and calmness, right this here in this very moment, in this holy ground that I'm standing on. Know that there's one power, one life, one presence that is God, that is all good. And knowing this is true, this is my truth and the truth for everyone here, present right here in this century. I recognize this truth and the joy and the love and the peace through the divine guidance that is in me, through me, and as me. I know I am supported, I'm always guided and directed my joy of living, to the joy that is in me, to the joy that is present all around me, to the joy that is present in all the events in my life right now. For I know, for I know that this is my truth. This is the essence, my essence, the God in me, the being of who I am. I am the art, the art that I am. So as I express my word, as I express my joy and my fulfillment, right deep inside me, I am so grateful. I am so thankful for God is all there is. And I see this in all, I see this in everyone, right here, right now. I am so grateful for the enriching and lovely music provided by Pat and Dave. I am so grateful for our ministry of prayer, who's holding the highest vision of the center. I'm grateful for Reverend Stacy, Reverend Cheryl, Reverend Dan, for their unconditional love and service. I am grateful for each and everyone here. And those who are here and not here. No way <coughs> this day, <clears throat> making this day. <clears throat> and giving us the best experience every Sunday. So, in gratitude and in faith, I release my word to the low mind, knowing the universe said yes, everything is signed, sealed, and delivered, and the joy is here. I simply say, and so it is. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. How is everyone? Good job. All right. Let's do this together. Yes. Perfect. 
Thank you, Reverend Cheryl. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Aldo, for setting the tone so beautifully in the beautiful prayer. So I want to ask you a question. What is happiness? Anybody have an answer? What is happiness? It's a feeling. Higher consciousness. Higher consciousness. Feeling? A feeling of joy. Utopia. Peace. Joy. Joy. Now. Are joy and happiness the same thing? What's the difference between joy and happiness? Happiness. Happiness is a state of being. Joy is content. Oh. <laughs> Happiness is light. Joy is deep. It's appreciation. Okay. I like joy is deep. Joy is lasting. Yes? Yeah. I feel like it's good. Songs can bring me joy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Songs bring me joy through memory. Right? There's something like that song. Yeah. I remember riding in the car with my parents hearing that at you know, five or six years old. I had a full circle moment with a song this week. And I'm not, you're not going to believe this. I know um, a lot of you aren't old enough to remember this. But in 1977, there was a movie that came out. And it celebrated its 40th birthday. Do you know the movie? No? Saturday Night Fever. Oh, yes. Saturday Night Fever. Remember that? And 40 years ago. Can you believe that? I am joyously moving along the age of the timeline. Yes, joyfully. And I remember that so well because I wasn't allowed to see the movie because I was too young to see it. But for, if you remember, or if you're my age, they um, changed the movie and cut out some of the parts and made it PG at some point in time. And so then I could go see it. But what sticks out from that movie, because it was, you know, John Travolta, John Travolta looked great in a suit, in that white suit, with his strut, but it was the, the music. And so the Bee Gees had um, a celebration on last, I think it was last Sunday. Yes, it was. Last Sunday, Easter Sunday, and I fell asleep. <laughs> but I started watching it during the week as I was preparing for the talk. And it's funny how it coincided with my talk. Because the memory that that movie brought about was a joyous feeling. That memory, the music, the Bee Gees. I remember my dad getting his brand new Fiat in 1978. And for Christmas, I bought him the 8-track, or 8-track tapes, of the Bee Gees, Saturday Night Live. Now, I didn't know this at the time, but when, I, when my dad taught me how to drive, when I was 16, so I was about 12 at the time, my dad still played that over and over and over. God, God love him. I think he, if he has it now, he's still probably still playing it. I think we listened to it for five years straight. But the memory that I had of my dad listening to that and us singing in the car in his Fiat, which just brought back great joy to me. And it came full circle as I realized this, as I got in my Fiat, and I was driving around. So joy, I have, is not satisfaction of the senses, but also of the mind. True joy is not dependent upon any circumstance or condition. You can always be joyful. <clears throat> I didn't say my name, but I'm Stacy Hilton. <laughs> the theme of the month is transformation and evolution. And the talk title is The Joy of Living. The suggested science of mind point of view, which is the only thing I've used out of this whole outline. We recognize the law of mind, which is the activity of spirit within us as supremely governing every activity in our life <coughs> and manifesting into the expression complete freedom in all areas of our life. That realization in itself 
will bring you a sense of inner peace and joy. Russell, you back there. Can you show that first picture, that, that video. chose that it would be for his highest and best good. March 12th came along, 2012, and um, they called my brother and they said, we've got a newborn come to the hospital, and Jaden and Jeffrey have been together ever since. It wasn't my idea of joy, necessarily. And I don't mean, you know, I love kids, but I am. And, and, the thought of going through that process and that pain was a little bit more than I could take for him. But guess what? I don't get to choose for him. I don't get to choose for him. He gets to choose for himself. So Jaden and Jeffrey are doing just fine, and I am thrilled to visit them. Jaden is a handful. Um, Russell, would you show that picture for me, please? Know who that is? Oh, yes. So the Dalai Lama is on the left, left, and Desmond Tutu, Bishop Desmond Tutu, is on the right. Look at the joyful faces that they have. 
So I showed you the picture of Jane and, and with Jeffrey in the background with his deep morning voice. Um, because for Christmas they bought me this book, the Book of Joy. And it was, my brother has this incredible way about him. As quiet and soft-spoken as he is, he's very thoughtful. And he observes. You know, he doesn't really say much, doesn't really ask too many questions, but he always knows and observes and, and has a way of finding the exact perfect thing for me for a present. And so I was told when he gave me this book, and at the time I had 3,000 jobs, and now I'm down to just three. And so I thought, I really want to use this in a talk, but when am I going to have time to read the book? And I really love when Reverend Cynthia would talk about a book in her service, and it's been one of my goals. And since we talked about things that I was going to do that are different, I decided to take that on this week. And so the Book of Joy, I have got to tell you, it is the most amazingly refreshing book. Let me just read you the bios of um, Desmond. I think there's a couple more pictures. Um, Russell, if you want more. This is the joy of their friendship. <laughs> yeah. There's actually a chapter in here that talks about them being so mischievous. So His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, his name is Dinzen Gayatso, describes himself as a simple Buddhist monk. He's a spiritual leader of the Tibetan people and of Tibetan Buddhism. He was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1989 and the U.S. Congressional Gold Medal in 2007. He was recognized at the age of two as the reincarnation of his predecessor, the 13th Dalai Lama. He's a passionate advocate for secular universal approach to, cultiv to cultivating fundam fundamental human values. For more than three decades, he has maintained an ongoing conversation and collaboration with scientists from a wide range of dis disciplines, especially through the Mind and Life Institute an organization that he co-founded. He travels extensively promoting kindness and compassion, interfaith understanding, respect for the environment, and above all, world peace. Now Desmond Tutu, I knew less about. Um, let's read a little bit about what, who Desmond Tutu is. Archbishop Emeritus of South Africa became a prominent leader in the crusade for justice and racial reconciliation in South Africa. He was also awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1984 and the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2009. In 1994, Tutu was appointed Chair of South Africa's Truth and Reconcili Reconciliation Commission by Nelson Mandela, where he pioneered a new way for countries to move forward after experiencing civil conflict and oppression. <coughs> Something else that I didn't know about Desmond Tutu, who is very traditional uh, Christian. Let me read that to you. And some of you may have known this. I think I knew it and I had forgotten it, but it really speaks to his character and who he is. For me. In the, in the lounge, the Archbishop relaxed into a couch while the Dalai Lama was perched in a large chair beside him. Next to the archbishop sat his daughter, I'm, I'm sorry if I mispronounced the name, Mofo, who was dressed in a brilliant green and red African print dress, her head wrapped with a matching fabric. The youngest of four children, she followed her father into the ministry and was now the executive director of the Desmond and Leah Tutu Legacy Foundation. During our trip, Mofo would get down on bended knee and propose to her girlfriend, Marceline Van Furry. The trip was only a couple months before the U.S. Supreme Court made its landmark ruling legalizing gay marriage, but the Archbishop had supported gay rights for decades. He famously had said that he would refuse to go to a homophobic heaven. <laughs> <laughs> what many forget, especially those who find themselves on the receiving end of his moral censure, is that Archbishop, Archbishop decries any form of oppression or discrimination wherever he might find it. 
Shortly after the marriage, Mofo was stripped of her ministry because the South African Anglican Church does not recognize gay, ministry, gay marriage. What an incredible, I'm both of them, incredible, incredible men to stand for what they stand for and to be all that they can be in spite of how things look to other people. They stay true to who they are. Last May, I believe, we did a um, we had Dr. Gary Simmons here. I know Juanita was there. A couple other you may have been there, and we had a workshop called "How to Live with the Q Process: How to Live with Nothing and No One Against You." Anybody remember that? Yeah, Beth. Um, I think Christina, you were there. And there's an exercise in that, and I think we did it with our Minister of Prayer group. Who have I come here to be? Both of those people would be on, on my list. The kindness and the compassion and the ability to stand up for what they believe in just really moves me. And the realization of oneness, you know? They are true mystics. I heard you all in the class in River Dance class talking about mystics. Sometimes we get confused about what a mystic is. Those two would certainly be on my list of what a mystic is. So the book, you're gonna, you're gonna be mad at me, but I did not order the book. <laughs> Sorry, Reverend Shaw. But Reverend Shaw will get it for you for next week. But the book is about the um, Bishop Tutu going to visit his friend. I don't think they've seen each other for a, I mean, uh, for a long time, but they have not been around each other either. But Bishop Tutu went to visit the Dalai Lama to, for his 80th birthday. And so that's why they got together. And it kind of has three, layer, three layers. The first being the teaching on joy, and obstacles of joy. The second is the latest science supporting the teachings, which as religious science, religious scientists, we're probably kind of interested in. And then the third part is um, the stories sharing their friendship. So it's a wonderful book. Um, and then in the back, it even has spiritual practices. And we might do one of, them, one of them before we leave here today. I obviously don't have time to talk about the entire book. Um, but what I did get from it, it reminded me of what true joy is and how I'm always, always able to achieve that. The obstacles of joy, there, I think they had, I don't know, four or five obstacles of joy. But what they boil down to, in my mind, is fear. That's really the only thing that I can see that I can call an obstacle of joy, fear. We step away, we don't want to be connected, we unplug ourselves and disconnect ourselves from our source because we're afraid from other people around us because we're afraid. And so when we find that ability to connect once again and know that God has got us, divine energy, infinite intelligence, whatever you want to call it, has us and is with us with every breath, and we, when we come back into that realization, we absolutely can experience joy in any situation that we're in. In job loss, in health challenges, relationship challenges, whatever it may be, we have the ability. So simple but not easy, as we always say. What else did I find in the book? Being human, it is, inev being human, it, it is inevitable to go through pain. Inevitable to go through pain. But as Reverend Cheryl says, suffering is optional. Suffering is always optional. But to grow, we must go through some stuff. So for me to say to my brother, you know what? That's really, you sure you want to do that, go through that pain and that heartache again? And for him to say, yeah, that's worth it to me. That's going to bring me joy. And for him to know that just really touches my heart. And there's things that we all go through on a daily basis sometimes, monthly basis sometimes, yearly basis, bi-yearly, whatever, that once we get through them, we look back and we're like, wow, I don't necessarily want to go through that again, 
but I can see my growth. And there's some kind of joy in that, knowing that you can get through this. The other thing that I found very interesting as far as science was concerned is we have four brain circuits. The first is dedicated to maintaining positive states. The second, our ability to recover from negative states. The third is our ability to focus. And then the fourth, let me read it to you, page 56. <coughs> the fourth and final circuit is our ability to be generous. That was amazing to me. That we had an entire brain circuit, one of four, devoted to generosity. It is no wonder that our brains feel so good when we help others, or are helped by others, or even witness others being helped, which Ekman, I'm not sure who Ekman is, had described as the elevation that is one dimension of joy. There was strong and compelling research that we come factory equipped for cooperation, compassion, and generosity. Isn't that fascinating? We have a whole circuit for generosity. It's just amazing to me. I mean, it's not surprising, I guess, if we think about it. So we are hardwired to be compassionate and generous. So when, when we withhold that, what are we doing? We're disconnected. We're not being our true nature. We're not being our authentic selves. They talk about the way to increase happiness <coughs> is reframing. Miss Queen of Reframe over there. Go on. Gratitude and generosity. Bishop Desmond Tutu's concept of Ubuntu. A person is a person through other persons. The idea that I come walk through these doors, and we all walk through these doors, and I am me because of you. Fascinating. But it's true. That's why that's what brings you here. I mean the music is fabulous. The messages are fabulous from time to time. <laughs> but it's you all. I am me because of you. The concept of Ubuntu. There are obstacles to joy and in a nutshell the underlying problem is fear. We discussed that. Achieving joy is just about staying in the awareness of grace, of the grace that we're all given, about being awake more than we're asleep. The Dalai Lama says we're here to find our happiness, and yet I still struggle sometimes. I like to think that I know best for someone, and so I find things <laughs> happen. I find myself as of late, trying to be more quiet and trying to be more in a state of observation. I don't need to tell people what to do. I really don't. I know we have somebody that, some minister, that says, I became a minister because I'm going to tell people what to do. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the extra added benefits I might have, but no. I would, I mean, you have a better solution to your problem than I ever will. My brother certainly knew what he was doing. He has truly found joy. And if, and if he told me, well, why would you want to run a congregation? Are you nuts? <laughs> <laughs> Jerry's still out on that one. <laughs> but we all have our answers, don't we? If we really sit and we think about it, and it might be a little help for a practitioner or a minister, but truly, we have our own answers. We know what's best for us. So the joy of living comes from being our authentic selves, acceptance of self and situations, the ability to know and trust. There's that word again, trust. When I'm in a quandary and I, you know, I, well, should I do this? What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? And we go and ask all of these people instead of just taking the time to go with them and trusting that your intuition is correct and accurate and on point. That inner compass that you have. Trust that this is, this is meant for good. Practice self-love. 
and love everyone along the way. Remember, we are hardwired for compassion and generosity. You don't have to like everybody's conversations, especially these days, right now. I'm sitting in the grocery store, and this person's talking about this, and that person's talking about this. What should we do over here in this world, in this part of the world? I don't like all the conversations. I don't like all the political views. But my job is not to entertain that and to get stuck in it. My job is to love them anyway and to keep it moving. I don't have to like everybody, but I have to love and respect everyone. And so with that, I'd like you to kind of get comfortable. We're going to do a, a spiritual practice here. <coughs> Passion meditation. There's probably no word the Dalai Lama and the Archbishop use more when describing the qualities worth cultivating than compassion. In short, the Dalai Lama feels that educating our children to have more compassion is the single most important thing we can do to transform our world. But we do not need to wait for the next generation to grow up before we can start to experience the benefits of compassion. Indeed, cultivating compassion for even 10 minutes a day, the Dalai Lama said, can lead to 24 hours of joy. Expanding our circle of concern is essential for both our well-being and well as well as, it, as that for the world. The following practice is adapted from the Compassion Cultivation Training Program. So as you're sitting there with your eyes closed, just take a few deep breaths. And think of someone you love very much. A relative a friend, or even a pet. Try to either see their face in your mind's eye or feel their presence. And notice how your heart feels when you think of them. If you feel warmth, tenderness, or affection, stay with these feelings. If not, just stay with the thought of your loved one. Silently say the following lines. May you be free from suffering. May you be healthy. May you be happy. May you find peace and joy. Breathe in. And as you breathe out, imagine a warm light coming from the center of your heart. Carrying your love to your loved one and bringing them peace and joy. Rejoice in the thought of your loved one's happiness for a minute or more. Think about that time when the person was having a difficult time. Notice what it feels like to experience their pain. Does your heart ache? Do you have a feeling of unease in your stomach or a desire to help? Simply notice the feelings and stay with them. And silently offer the following phrases. May you be free from suffering. May you be healthy. May you be happy. May you find peace and joy. Imagine that a warm light emerges from the center of your heart 
and touches the person you have in mind, easing their suffering. Finish with a heartfelt wish that they be free of suffering. Now think of a time when you experienced great difficulty and suffering. Maybe you were a child, a teenager, maybe even now. Place your hand on your heart and notice feelings of warmth, tenderness, and caring towards yourself. Reflect on the fact that just like all people, you want to be happy and free of suffering. Silently offer the following phrases. May I be free from suffering. May I be healthy. May I be happy. May I find peace and joy. And so in that, while you're sitting there with that, know that as much joy as you are, I am, and as much joy as I am, you are, let your heart be filled with that this week as you go through the week and navigate your week. I know that I love you all, and you are more than generous with me, and I intend to be with you. I love you. I support you. Namaste. So All right, so if you would just close your eyes and with me, just stay in that space that we've all created together, a space of joy, that space of peace, that feeling that we allow ourselves to have every time we walk into the sanctuary together. Oh, and I'm just so grateful for that feeling, for that energy, for each and every person that shows up in love, that shares generously their love, their tithes, talent, treasure, time. This is a good, great place, a good, great space, and a good, great day. So each of you, go out and have that feeling pour out over everybody else. And I can't wait to see how this turns out.